What's been fantastic is that the guys who have organised the event have saved the best before lunch. So no one is allowed to leave the room. Want full attention, lots of questions, and make this as interactive as possible. So I have a really easy job. I don't have to do any thinking. I'm just asking questions as we go. And the first question is, would you like to introduce yourself? Please, Nina. <laughs> Thank you very much, Lawrence. Um, good afternoon, everybody. Um, my name is Nina Jones. I'm Head of Advisor Experience for Fidelity International. Hello, Nicolas Pinson. I'm working for Amundi, uh, and I represent the technology uh, entity of, uh, of Amundi Technology. And I'm responsible for the product strategy. And I'm also have a transversal role around M&A, for example, who will buy technology at some point. Amundi, just so you know. Uh, and I'm Nini Franceschi. I'm heading up Wealth Management Sweden at Nordea. So an international panel team, and we're going to get started now. Um, everyone knows about the Umbrella app, I think. You know, you know to put questions into, into Brella, um, and I will move us through. So I think we've got seven questions, maybe five-ish minutes each, and we'll then have ten minutes for questions. So maybe this is a today's look and an outlook, but Nina, start us off. What should a personalised investment experience look like? Goodness, what a big question. Um, and I do feel, by the way, that I'm going to nick a load of ideas that you've already heard this morning. Um, yeah, I, I think, and I'm, I'm not seasoned in financial services, so it's been about four years. So it's been fascinating coming into an industry. Um, I think, number one, it'd be really great if we talked in a language that actually customers understood. Um, and it's a personal bugbear of mine, but genuinely, I think the personalization comes after we are able to communicate to customers uh, in language that they understand. So I, I think I've been very privileged. I've spent most of my career working with the top 1% of, of basically the population and wealth, whether that's through cars or through now wealth management. Um, but we, I've heard it a lot today. There's an advice gap that's huge, but I think there's an even bigger gap, which is actually people engaging uh, and understanding that they are investing. It's called their workplace pension. Sorry, and I'm going to get very UK specific. They're auto-enrolled. So pretty much everybody in the UK population who is working is an investor. It's just that no one understands that. So I think when we start getting into personalised investment experience, I've written down loads of things. I think it is digital first, but I don't think it's digital only. So I think it's about how we have those channels open um, for customers to actually engage and have a conversation that they understand <laughs> what we're saying to them. Um, and I think that then leads to, for me, that, that clients, customers feel empowered and in control. Because money and wealth is an amazing capability for people to live their lives how they want to live them. So I think an investment experience increasingly becomes about how we enable our clients to live the lives they want to live and to be financially well when they're doing it. That sounded very philosophical. No, it, was, uh, it was on the money, uh, Nina, as always. Nicola. I completely agree with you. Uh, I personally, and Amundi, does not believe AI will replace uh, human. Uh, we strongly believe that uh, AI is an enabler, is a facilitator, is an accelerator, uh, but we are in a business of a relationship-based business. Uh, my banker, I know him, since I'm young, is managing the asset of the family. Uh, and I strongly believe that that part of being able to capture uh, the experience, uh, the past experience of the family, uh, knowing the individual, knowing their uh, eagerness to uh, possibly uh, have a positive impact on the society, that's something very, very important. And I believe that um, until this point, family offices and wealth managers were able to offer that. And slowly we are going to, with AI, with automation, improve that and low down that barrier down to mass market or mass affluent customers. But truly, the, the one tricky thing to solve is nobody wants to talk about financial. Uh, uh, what's your financial plan? I have no clue. Uh, but if you ask me, do you want a, are you planning to have babies? Are you planning to buy an apartment? Are you planning to buy a car? Uh, when you will retire, do you want to have a complementary revenue? Those are the questions that we need to capture and translate into financial objectives. And that's our job. And, and that's where we have so much to do. Agreed. And Nini? 
Well, firstly, when it comes to your original question, uh, I, I would say that it differs between customers, obviously. Um, and I'm thinking quite a lot about uh, to be relevant, to be really sort of on top of the data, and we'll probably come to how we can use the data. But that is, and I represent then fairly wealthy cl clusters and, and clients, so, so uh, even in those segments, they are very digitized today, and they expect everything that we do in advisory, human to human, to also be at their screen in their mobile app and so forth. So I think omni and personalization is here to stay, um, and it should be relevant, and it should be their assets, their preferences, uh, so it's according to, it differs between customers basically. Yeah, yeah, I think all good points, and I think the audience would agree. Okay, let's move to question two. In terms of customer expectations around digital engagement, especially with one eye on maybe today's generation and the wealth generation between, or the transfer, how, how are those uh, expectations evolving? Nina. Oh, do you want me to go I first? am going to mix it up, so you need yeah, to all be on your A game. Whether Nina. I, get, I just say everything and then everyone else can copy. No, I'm joking. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, yeah. So um, we've just done some research, actually, and uh, 18 to th the lovely 18 to 34s, um, they're mobile. So literally, I listened to this lovely woman say, I had to go around to my mum and dad's and borrow the, their laptop <laughs> because our app didn't do what they needed them to do. So they don't have, so I think that mobile, I feel like I'm in a kind of marketing group here, but mobile first, I think is really, really important. Yeah. However, I, but same group, when they were first starting on their investment journey, whether that is even just entering a stocks and shares ISA, they still want that reassurance. So I think that, did, now what they probably don't want to do is pick the phone up and wait for a contact center to spend two blooming minutes answering the phone and going through the DPA. So arguably there's a human at the end of a chat capability, but I think it is, it's that ease. No one's, met, I couldn't agree more, Nicola. Honestly, I know we find investing really fascinating, right? But generally, people want to be in a bar drinking wine and eating food and having chats with friends. They don't want to be spending... Some do, which is brilliant. Allow them to do that. But most people just want to do the simple stuff really easily, chuck in 20,000 or whatever it is, or 200 quid into my ISA and move on with my life. So how do we enable that to uh, happen? So I think that's what digital comes to for me, is super, super easy, frictionless, Johan said most of it in his chat with his four points. I can't remember what they are, but uh, his, his yeah. were quite right. And, and look, we're at a stage where, you know, mobile apps and becoming omni-channel is still a journey. We'll get past that. Yeah. And we have to offer customers the choice that they want to consume, right? I don't know why you thought about in a bar drinking wine when we have a Frenchman on the stage, but Nicola, please. <laughs> uh, I would agree on the simplicity, but also I would also agree on uh, it has to be anywhere, anytime. Uh, I mean, when I think about my financial assets, it's on Sunday on my couch uh, and not during the week because during the week I work like any other investors. Uh, so I think it's also very important uh, to offer these capabilities whenever we want, uh, whenever we could uh, access it. Uh, that's the first one. Uh, and second, the omni-channel. I think it's very important. Uh, I think we are not there yet. Um, let's not argue that the most wealthy are usually not that digital native, not yet. So how we can manage digital, digital readiness in a, in a context where the wealth is still stored with people who are not digital ready yet. And I think that's one of the challenges as well. And on top of that, uh, the omni-channel uh, is also a challenge for the distributors because uh, as an advisor, as a private banker, as a banker, uh, how can I deal with my client dealing with text message, WhatsApp, Signal, emails, phone calls, uh, mail, the physical one, you know, the one you post. Uh, so that's also something that we need to tackle. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And Nini? Uh, I just want to add that I think we, we expect personal, digital and personal to be everywhere because we, we are so used to it from social media ads, uh, from HBO, Netflix, that are actually, you know, putting recommendations. I think there's embedded in the expectation, even, even 
from my elderly clients, I can see that now, especially post-COVID, post the pandemic, there's a huge sort of drive for doing everything anywhere, anytime, like you said. And I think that is uh, amazing. It's beneficial. We have to be sort of harvesting the possibilities and opportunities from that. On the other hand, it comes also with some challenges because recommendations are normally based on what you used to do. And what we saw in COVID was actually that people had so much time, so everyone became a stockbroker on their own, right? Um, and what happened was that they were quite successful until when? <coughs> 2022 came so of course then we have to to be personal and be you know relevant recommendation needs still to be based on our thinking or strategic asset allocations and everything so yeah. it's a bit more complex than than just seeing the behavior of the client yeah. um, I just wanted to add yeah no good points okay question three key data challenges faced by firms when implementing personalization strategies I'm going to ask you, Nicola, to lead us off on this one, please. Thank you. Um, banks are running on archaic systems, scattered data, uh, inconsistent data. Uh, I think as a client, as a consumer of financial services, I expect my financial provider, my supplier, because like I buy cosmetic, I'm French, I buy cosmetic. Uh, I expect my financial provider to know me, to know my age, to know my wealth, to know my salary, to know my life expectation, to know my babies if I have any. Uh, and we need to change the way we treat data from having this data scattered in, into a system to data that is uh, with value, not just as an input, as, 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 as a commodity that we can use. And for that, uh, to be honest with you, uh, AI is there, uh, but it's not the, the sole uh, provider of data. We, when we talk about personalization, for example, the tone of voice, how you interact with your client, these are the things that we need to capture. So we need to capture emails, we need to capture the, the way the client interacts with digital capabilities, uh, where he goes into the website, uh, possibly building on the fly, customized experience with AI. Yeah. Uh, so these are the things that we need to work on and that's quite honorary because the entire industry change. Uh, building cars, they do it. Cosmetic, do it. Winemaker, do it. Yeah. Uh, so. But if you want to really get to personalization, and I know we experienced this in Northern Trust, getting the data out from their underlying spaghetti of systems that have been built up over, over decades with people who probably long since retired in terms of the ability to maintain that stuff. Get it out, get it up, get it central, make sure it's of the highest level of quality, and then you can start to do things. Nina, you, you said to me in our extensive research, maybe our eighth prep session, not, not <laughs> um, that you're coming at this from a business user perspective. So in terms of any views on this question around data? Well, I would say uh, exactly, I'm not tech at all, uh, but um, the data has been a challenge to us in Nordea, uh, as in all firms, and I listened into some sessions this morning, seems to be key. Uh, what we did was actually to, to really, the first years, we, we really needed to just consolidate and try to sort of harvest the data to be able to be, build quite easy, small use cases, actually building from basics. And then now we can actually start interpreting data to build more complex use cases, driving also personalization for, for uh, uh, the slightly more demanding uh, clients of mine, so to speak. But then you can always think about whether could, you know, sometimes you want to build it top down so, mm. so that you really aim for the most complex. But in this case, I think data was the sort of the, the obstacle. Um, so it's taken time, but we're in a much better place. And I'm happy to see that we managed now to launch financial plan that you didn't like, Nicola, <laughs> but uh, so that clients can actually follow it uh, in their mobile app and they can slice the data, they can run performance periods as they like uh, and versus different benchmarks. So it's their particular assets and, and uh, their share of whatever fund or wrapper they might have. Um, but then it was also about sort of the processing to do this on an instant basis um, so it's tons of things, I would say, uh, but we 
mobilized a bit and we will continue, but it's definitely, it's all about the data. Yeah, it is, it is. And, and maybe adding something here, uh, adding the complexity of, uh, we need the data to be secure. We've got GDPR in Europe, well, not in Europe anymore, but you still belong to Europe somehow, UK. Uh, so securing the data, ensuring that there is data privacy, uh, also enabling the client to know what we do with their data. Mm -hmm. I think there is, a, there is an eagerness to understand that as well. And when we go through that data transformation journey, we also rely a lot on third party provider. So it's also how we can enhance ourselves to be more in control of those providers. We talk a lot of chat GPT. It's nice, but they are feeding on data that we don't control. Yeah, yeah, I think so. And uh, we'll talk a little bit more about regulatory constraints in a second. I would say on ChatGBT, I both delighted and then disappointed Nina just before, because I actually said, I put to her a poem about Nina. And it was a very nicely composed four verse poem. And then I showed her it was composed by ChatGDP, uh, GPT. So sorry about that. Disappointed. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. but it was good. Must do better. Uh, Nina, any um, views? Everything. That that uh, my two panel have said everything that's been said the morning, the legacy system. So I don't almost want to go back through that because I think we all know that. I, I think the other thing that I was just reflecting on is the context. So I think there's something really interesting and we're finding it at the moment. The context changes as well as to why you want that data. So, um, you know, particularly when we're looking at, so for example, at the moment, we're just going through uh, an aspect with capital gains tax. So, so the capital gains tax now has gone down to £3,000, which will be suddenly actually those gains. I'm not saying that we're, a, that, you know, when you're at 12 and a half thousand or whatever it was, there's, there's probably a little bit more leeway than suddenly the government's saying, right, now it's £3,000. So, so I think there is also the context of the questions that are being asked of the data or the demands that are being placed on the data that weren't known or thought of at the time when the data was created. That, that sort of made sense in my head. I don't know whether that made any sense to anyone else, but I, I guess that's, and that partly is where the legacy aspect I think comes in, which is we don't, we're not, we weren't aware and we're really finding it at the moment about you know, just that shift in either the regulatory landscape or the taxation landscape, as well as client, I could not agree more with Nini, as well as, the client expectations changing from data from our perspective that may well have been in the system for 13 years. Yeah, and I'm going to stay with you, Nina, because I think you're um, you're actually straddling question three and four. Question four is around tools and technologies mm. to facilitate the implementation of personalization. And any specific things to call out there? God, well, I mean, oh, we could just endlessly talk about data, can't we? And I, I think um, Charlie talked about it in the previous panel. Actually, it's around starting small. Mm -hmm. But I think you end up with, um, for me, I suppose, capabilities that bridge. So data's one. Uh, I think there's also something about content, and you probably gathered I'm mad about content, about how we're able to. So how are we able to marry the data with content and provide relevance to the client? So I think that a content management capability, and that for me is very, very broad. So that could be in-flight transactions. So I spent two and a half years leading re-registration and transfers. Still haven't solved that. Whoever talked about their pension transfer, I'm going through that at the moment. It would take forever. But literally, thank God I know about it because I've given up looking for any updates on it. Um, so yeah, so I think tools and technologies really, it is, it's that, you know, I've applied it to every job I've had, which is the system, the process, the people, the data. How does that get structured? Um, data is difficult, but, but content, I think, also needs to be thought of as carefully and how that's structured, the taxonomy, the tagging, et cetera, that we sometimes, I think, perhaps neglect. Yeah, I think all of that's fair. I think you started out with the f something that was really resonating in, in the bank. We're all in pressured, you know, market conditions, which is start small, you know, quick wins, start small, decide, and then incremental benefit as we go. Nicola. Um, I think to a certain extent we're also lucky because at the end the data needs to be fresh and to a certain extent we don't really need to deep dive into the legacy system to have fresh data. We can also capture data real time, learn and leverage uh, not only AI but also statistical analysis and statistical algorithm to build and to derive data that are relevant and, and, and on top of I think we can also revise the way we build, distribute, and serve clients 
by also redefining our entire target operating model, people system process, and as you mentioned, it's not, not only about data, but also about the content that you provide and the content that you exchange with your client. And, and Nini? Well, I can only say that I don't really have a view on tools and technology, but I know that we work, of course, we build things in-house, uh, and then we work with a lot of third-party providers, especially a niche one. Uh, but I think it was interesting with the content provision, because I think that is the super essential part to personalization, that you really can target your messaging. Uh, and that's Funny. probably, but we'll talk maybe about you know, your measurements, yeah. are you relevant to your client? Yeah, yeah, we'll come to that. I think your point, Nini, is so well made that, you know, why would we be arrogant enough to have a closed system that's only developed by our companies? Certainly from my bank's perspective, you know, open architecture, the ability to plug into fintechs to really offer a whole of market solution within the context of the solution that you're building. We today. love startups with good ideas. Yeah, yeah, well, they get you there faster, don't they? Um, <laughs> So in terms of uh, question five, how can the success and effectiveness of personalized digital experience be measured? And I do think that's really relevant in today's market conditions, budgets are tough and so on. Nini, lead us off. Yeah, yes, um, I think I, I'll just state the obvious firstly, and that is the bottom line and customer satisfaction. Because if you're really successful, then this contributes to business. Uh, but if you want to learn and try out, then of course you have to measure things like conversion rates, retention rates, maybe set up twin groups and see if personalization sort of outperforms general messaging or general services and so forth. Mm. And I think that is super important to really do at the stage where you are now when you keep launching fairly new uh, features everywhere, then that you really don't launch it to everyone at the same time, but make sure that you actually can try out and see, do you really get the benefits out of this as intended? Okay, good. Just to say I have one question on the app, so no pressure team. Um, Nicola, please. Uh, I fully agree more with what you're just saying. Uh, I would say net promoters, the typical digital basically KPIs, uh, net promoter score, churn, protecting my client base, conversion, repeat rate, and also, as you said, um, we are not good at that yet, but A-B testing, uh, you define two different strategies and you see the one that works. You can also, you can deliver the exact same service, but the way you deliver it, the tone of voice, the, 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 the package surrounding it, is really something that, that we need to in, uh, improve as a financial providers. And that's something that moving forward, all the e-commerce platforms have been very, very successful at it. And moving forward, I think we will share the same KPIs as pure e-commerce platforms. Yeah, yeah. And Nina? Um, yeah, I mean, to, to Nini's point really around, so I think I've wanted to run a few businesses and I think there are four major outcomes. So exactly what you said, revenue, profit margin, however you want to look at that, um, client satisfaction, cost, probably really importantly, um, and then employee satisfaction. I know Johan mentioned that earlier. Um, so they're the outcomes. And then I guess I increasingly literally see my entire world through customer journeys. So we, I understand the life cycle, I understand how they come in and how they go out, whether that's an advisor or whether that's an end investor or a DFM provider, it doesn't matter who it is, they all come in at some point and they all go out. Hopefully they don't go out too, too often. Um, and then I think it's how are those key journeys, the measurement on that. So how many people go through it? How quickly are they going through it? We were talking yesterday with my team around um, re <laughs> my favourite topic, re-registration and transfer. It's only that's how we get a lot of assets onto our platform. Um, you know, wh what have we seen in the past of all of the providers? Because, of course, we're going out into the big wide world with the industry and we all need to play nice. Um, but how are we able to take that information of past experience, what Nenny was saying, we are going to use the past to then predict the future going forward and therefore set client expectations for that journey. So, um, yeah, I, th I think that... That measure, but I'm mad on metrics. I think it comes from my engineering company background. If I haven't got a dashboard, I feel <laughs> like I'm bereft. And that dashboard will broadly be around the success of the key customer journeys that drive to those yeah. four yeah. outcomes. Yeah, and I'm sure you would agree as a panel that um, <clears throat> ever more, you know, business outcomes, metrics, measurement are just a thing. 
that uh, we all expect in running our business. I'm going to read the next question in the context first and then ask the question. So given, given the drive for personalization and the complexities around personalization, which requires an understanding of clients' preferences to the next level, to what extent do managers need new skill sets of coaching and life guidance? So this is a, maybe inv involves the data, but let's assume that the data is there and this personalization thing is never going away. To what extent do managers need new skill sets around coaching and life guidance? Who shall I pick on first? Nini. Um, to me, since I'm a Swede, so managers, could it be, if it's the sort of the, the manager of the client relationship or the manager of the managers, uh, I would say that from a leadership perspective, just briefly, I think it's super important that you actually manage to mobilize your staff to embrace technology and actually embrace also personalization, that it could drive efficiency. Yeah. Because what I see is basically, since we b became more digitized and personalized, I also see that um, the, the um, respective private banker relationship managers, uh, they now have 20% more clients or clusters per advisor. Mm -hmm. So it's super efficient, but the time that they actually gain is of course that they can meet clients in sort of value-adding dialogues around business rather than admin and so forth. Because, um, I mean, truthfully, I think they have spent quite a lot of time on, on admin and not really relationship strengthening yeah. uh, sort of to or, or um, uh, yeah, topics. So, so I think that part is really important for leaders to be aware. And then when it comes to the private bankers, uh, because I, I look at this from an omni perspective that you still would have your sort of at the center of the relationship, there would be some specialists. They uh, can actually benefit greatly from this by strengthening the know-how and the insights of the customer by utilizing the data that is actually out there. If we can help them, yeah. in particular, I would point at the unmanaged data here. And as I think in some sessions, someone was pointing at all the unmanaged data, but that's where you have quite a lot of insights that are in the relationship manager's head. But if you increase uh, the number of clusters, for example, in affluent segment, of course, it's really hard to keep that just in your head, right? Uh, but to prepare for meetings, also be relevant when the customer logs in, I think, and, and that this is transparent between channels. I think then, then actually that is sort of the next steps in wealth management yeah. to a large degree. And then you can spend your time on, on the essential matters that is actually the purpose with your wealth as a client. What is your aspirations in life? Uh, quite a lot of persons are also very engaged in ESG, that they want to sort of invest really uh, carbon uh, yeah. free. <laughs> um, or they, want, they have a higher course with their wealth. It might be eternal. And you can take those uh, more insightful dialogues. But it, of course, then puts pressure on that the private banker is really good at not only numbers. Yeah. Because numbers someone else will handle. I think there's a lot in what you've said. And if I recap, I think what I heard was, you know, you do have the need for people to embrace the new technologies. And probably there's the distribution curve of the early adopters. Yeah. The 70% in the middle and those and, and how do we work away on that and maybe new talent and you, you get to a point where you, you're just delivering higher value engagement and hopefully grow the firm as a result as well as the, uh, the client's portfolio. Nicola, any views? Um, I focused on one thing, the coaching part. I think lots of private bankers are also very f scared of losing the client relationship, being digitalized, uberized. Uh, and I think it's a matter of the management uh, to also see the technology as an enabler for the ultimate service provider rather than something that will replace them. And I think there is a coaching area here because uh, we are still in a relatively archaic way of distributing products and more especially on the upper end of the market. So the coaching part is really important. Uh, seeing uh, AI or ChatGPT or whatever as helping me to build my storytelling rather than replacing me. 
uh, and I think compliance is here as well to enforce and secure that they won't be completely disabled, uh, replaced. And I yeah. think the coaching part is really important. Yeah, yeah, agreed. And, and Nina? Um, so I knew I wanted to call out Tamara. So I was looking at my notes because uh, there were a few people that really resonated today. And Tamara, I think, talked about it this morning, which was around financial inclusion. Um, you probably gathered I'm a bit of a fan of financial inclusion. Um, and re-registration. Uh, and re-registration, <laughs> yeah, which is part of financial inclusion. Um, so I think I, I couldn't agree more with Nini. I th I, and I was talking to someone last week. Um, I think really where and I'm willing today that I think where advice goes to, let's say by 2030, is actually a coach, is being able to coach clients around what is it, and Nini mentioned this, about what they want to achieve from their life. And I think from the UK perspective, there are two really, really salient aspects which, are, which drive this. One of them is it's now the onus on the individual to fund their retirement. I don't think that's actually registered yet because of the DB schemes that we still have going on and we have a state pension as well. Now, don't get me wrong, when you're on 900 quid a month, that probably is reality. So how are we enabling people to really understand that, the, that they are empowered and they can do that? But they need to be because they are the only ones that are going to fund their retirement. Trust me, a 25-year-old ain't going to be getting 900 quid a month right? from the state when, by the time we get there. So that's one important stat, that onus, and I really feel passionate that it is the financial services industry, we have the capability of being able to do that. That could be our contribution back to society, potentially. The other thing is women. So in the next 20 years, in the UK, 50% of the wealth will be under women, mainly because blokes die earlier. So, souls. Because uh, I'm looking around the room, there are Thanks a lot of that. you, right? We're all going to be, so, there'll be about 20 of us still here. The, the rest of you probably won't be. So I, I think women, um, so women from it, if we go back to those four outcome metrics are really important, right? To profit, they're important to client satisfaction. Um, so how are we able to open up this dialogue and get much more financially inclusive through a coaching conversation? Now, the reason why you can do that is exactly what Nicola and Mi Nini were saying, is because the machines will do the work. So we, we have conquests, which we're just with Infidelity. This isn't a plug for conquest, by the way. Um, but it is remarkable. So they've run chat GPT across that. And basically, you just talk to your computer. That's what chat GTP does. You just ask it questions. So you're chatting at your laptop. And it's coming back because it's effectively got, or it does financial planning, for clients, it's got all the tax regulation in the back, it's got all the tax, it's got cash flow modeling, it's got all of that. So, so you don't need a human being to do that. You don't need an administrator or a power planner to be spending four hours to do a plan to then say, the client says, oh, actually, I want to buy the boat. I forgot to tell you about that. And then the spends another four hours redoing it. The machine does that. What that does, and I think someone mentioned it earlier as well, that assisted human it allows for me much richer conversations that Nini was talking about and probably has with her clients about what is it that you want to achieve from your life as opposed to got this amazing portfolio and it's gone up 8% in the past year. Don't worry, it'll probably go 5% down next year, but we won't talk about that right now. That I truly believe the democratization is financial inclusion is about how people want to live their lives. I'm going to shut up now because I'm going to keep going and going and yeah, going. Yes, on. yes, you are. <laughs> and, and how are all the men in the room feeling right now? Yeah. <laughs> um, but you'll be re-registering when I'm six foot under, so that's okay. Um, last question. You, you need to promise me, nod your heads, that this is going to be 30-second response each. Yes? Okay. <laughs> Give the audience one or two bits of regulation that we need to be thinking about now or in the future. Nini, go. 30 seconds. Okay. Not you. Oh, um, but I think MyFID, do I pronounce it correctly? I think it's always relevant when it comes to investment advice. Uh, and then you have the GDPR, yeah. integrity, privacy, and so forth. And the challenge for the other two is as we come down, they're going to have to get some new ones, right? <laughs> Nicola. Uh, ESG, uh, the Capital Market Union. Uh, you need to be aware that uh, the EU is starting to regulate the distribution of financial product. RIS. Uh, will be a game changer in the way we distribute life insurance products and insurance products uh, as well. So the, the regulatory layer uh, will also frame the way uh, we have to change the way we distribute products and the way we interact with clients. Very good. 
I don't think I've ever answered anything in 30 seconds, but I'll give it... Uh, Consumer GT, obviously, I can't sit here. So, UK, uh, Consumer GT, for me, blessing. I still think we're doing it a bit by rote, ticket boxes and stuff, but if we, if we get that, I think that's really exciting. Um, and then the other one, which I'm not close to, but I know it's happening, is pension outcome. You've probably gathered I'm mad about retirement as well. That's the other thing I'm mad about. Uh, mainly because I'm approaching it. Um, pension outcome. So, the FCA is doing a study at the moment, and I think that could be really, really... I hope, I hope, interesting around how it will make us help people have healthy retirements. But at least for you, you'll have longer in retirement than some of us. Absolutely. And I am living till I'm 100, by the way. Very good. I have, <laughs> I have little doubt about that. Right. I'm going to reverse the order. I have three questions, but I would like to see if there's any hands in the audience. Just, yes, please. Is there a microphone just, just for this lady over here in front of me? Oh, well, you go first, sir, and then I will come to you. Hi. I feel like an auctioneer. Am I on? Hi, Steve Kowal from MSCI. Uh, Nini, I'd like to pick up on something that you touched on, which there's a lot of different aspects to personalization, but from a purely investment personalization context, how much it, the direction of travel and wealth generally has been to, I hate to say it this way, shoehorn people into well-controlled model portfolios, but that, of course, doesn't allow for personal expression of desires and from a portfolio cut context. Do you see that changing? Yeah. You mentioned ESG as, as one catalyst for that. Or is that still kind of more fringy and most people are just going to be very happy to be told what to put their money in and live their lives? Uh, the and bar? so we can get a few questions in. Just shorter answer than before, <laughs> Nina. <laughs> uh, so the answer is yes. We've just done a pilot. We did it in Canada. I think that move towards personalizing investing uh, is only going to grow. Um, and not just with ESG, actually, but with a lot of other things. So we are talking around all sorts of different types of investment strategy, but at the core of it is personalizing it to me as an individual, whether that's funds or... Um, and, and it's, I'm not an investment management professional, but basically what that fund does when. So, so yes, the answer is definitely. But Very good. Could, could, could I just add, because I think it's a super interesting question, and I think from a model portfolio perspective, I think we really have to work with the model portfolios, the concepts of them, and what do we sort of, what, what do they entail, how should they look like, and they need to be much more uh, modernized, building on the same theory, possibly, but I think the world has changed a bit, but I think it's super interesting, and, and, and also that you have clients that are very, very self-driven, and of course then they are not subject to investment advice, then you serve something else, especially as a wealth manager, uh, then could be administration, <laughs> other legal services, and so forth. Okay. But, um, I, I will move us on in the interest of one or two. Please, your question. Hello. Uh -huh. Thank you so much for the panel. Uh, my name is Parul Gupta. I'm from Arabesque. Uh, we are one of the startups that is ha helping accelerate the personalized journey because we provide pers personalized portfolios reflecting values driven by AI. Uh, I get a sense when I hear from different panels and all that there is probably still an underappreciation of how fast the trends are changing, uh, you know, because we still think there is time. Uh, there's, uh, Nini, you mentioned about values, but you also mentioned that people have been doing stock trading themselves, people are getting more comfortable, maybe they're not doing right, and that's where wealth advisors come in. Uh, and that is like the Netflix blockbuster example where, you know, blockbuster didn't think Netflix will like, just overtake them immediately. Uh, and I think that's the question I'm saying, even the gentleman asked, how fast do you think, because we see this is a matter of 12, to, um, 12 months to two years when everybody would want personalized portfolios like a Netflix stream streaming rather than model portfolios. Okay, good question. I will stop you. Quick answers from our panel. I, I can only say that I, I tend to agree. Uh, I think the speed of the change and the, the behavior and the demand is really, really fast. Um, and, and we're trying to catch up with that. But then you have to be also relevant and provide the right data, right? So, and, and then being a big sort of old player, of course, then you have the rucksack of all your, your uh, sort of legacy systems and so forth. But I think we've passed through a lot of the, that now. Uh, but I think we'll, we're entering a completely different uh, landscape, especially when I look at the next gens that will inherit the wealth. So that's what keeps me awake at night. 
Uh, and Nicola, any view on that particular question? Uh, typically, the, the, the way we tackle it is we try to decompose allocation in thematic investments, for example, something that's peak, uh, the old people aging and how we sustain them, the transition, uh, the energy transition. Uh, so basically being able to decompose the allocation, the typical model portfolio, in more in a cross-asset portfolio manager to make a buzzword, in decomposing the allocation in different buckets, each bucket uh, being understandable by a normal human being, not a financial person, uh, on top of ensuring risk adequacy. I think that's, that's, that's what we're trying to do. Agreed. And I will um, pass on, please, sir. Um, my name is Yadu Singh, uh, ISG. Uh, we cover the asset and wealth from a technical perspective. The maturity question has come to uh, be asked uh, a lot in terms of how mature is the asset and wealth management industry uh, in terms of automation, outsourcing, etc. And the panel topic is personalization. So the question is personalization with significant legacy technical change or personalization without significant legacy change? Great question. Um, I wouldn't want to answer that, so I'm going to pass to Nicola first. I'm going to try. Uh, without, uh, it's, I think it's a, it's a dream to change uh, an archaic infrastructure developed in COBOL. There is no uh, alive COBOL developer anymore. Uh, you are the last one. Uh, <laughs> so you have, a lot of, you have a lot of work. Uh, so I, I think in the way we see it is... Uh, we don't, uh, basically she said as well, uh, we don't try to do, it, to do it bottom up. We try to build uh, a satellite component that will agilize the ability to capture data, structure data, and bring personalization. We don't, we don't aim to restructure the data. Why? Because uh, the data is a maturity and there is no need to look at the entire financial history of, of an investor to know now what he wants because of his own context again baby, house, travel, blah, blah, blah. Any other panelists like to respond to that question? Nina, I can see. Uh, yeah, I, I, it's got to be the latter, but, but unfortunately I'm not sure that we can not do the former from an emotional um, perspective. I think, I think we are, we basically just keep fighting away a losing battle really. Um, and I think when I look at when I look at automotive, um, you know, do you you're not going to build your electric car to a certain extent on the same technology that you built your internal combustion engine on, right? Because it's a completely different. I know that someone said it's very similar. It's a very very different concept. So, uh, do you just end up sort of building another factory? And, and that's the that's my uh, sorry. I always use automotive production um, analogies, which is probably not helpful in financial services. But but uh, yeah, I, I, I just think we've been at the former for too long, and we've probably just got to say enough's enough, which is probably not terribly European and British, and say right, let's let's just see what what we can get and okay. start over. I'm going to now be mean moderator. We have one minute and fifty seconds left. You have thirty seconds each panel. And I'm going to ask on behalf of somebody who said, have you seen any used cases for personalization in your business relating to product and investment portfolios? Yes or no, Nina? And if you would wish to volunteer any further information, that'd be great. And I will go along the, the row. Yeah, I mean, Conquer, I keep talking about Conquer. Conquest is remarkable what I've seen from a planning capability that enables you to get the individual customer context and to actually come out with a plan in more or less seconds. Excellent. Nicola. Um, actually, we are already doing it. Uh, uh, MSCI already has a portfolio optimizer under constraints, para one. I'm making some publicity for you. Uh, so the technology is already there. Uh, AI, you believe that it's a new technology? No, it's been developed in the 70s. Uh, so there is nothing new. Uh, data has already been there. So in, in my view, it, it's not a game changer. It's more like embracing it. Uh, and we all have all the components to deal with it. Thank you. Nini. And since you took fairly all of my time. I would just say that um, uh, example is the financial plan that I mentioned. You set it with your private banker and then it's accessible in the mobile app. 
and you can follow it up and you can look at your asset allocation and God forbid they start changing, then you know it keeps the private banker busy. Excellent. Okay, I'm sure we could talk for a long time. I will finish this up there. Three things before we go. Thank you to the audience. Uh, tried to get through some of the questions and realize some of them have been covered, but thank you. Uh, I'm sure everyone's hungry, point two, so we won't keep you. And thirdly, can you join me in thanking our panelists? Thank you. Thank you.